Hi from upstate. Uh, we're going to do chapter 8 of All Quiet on the Western Front. And for the remaining chapters of this book, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, we're going to try and focus on using the literary devices we've found so far for getting the bigger ideas or the central ideas or the themes of the book. So we've talked about how the author thinks about the dehumanization of people. We've talked about justice. We've talked about truth. We've talked about all kinds of things. And so we're going to see a little bit more of that as this book winds to towards the end. So chapter eight is a relatively quick chapter compared to the others. And so here we go. Chapter eight. I already know the camp on the Moors. It was here that Himmelstas gave Jaden his education. Education means beating him up. But now I know hardly anyone here. As ever, all is altered. So everything is altered. This, this one sentence alone describes the experience of the soldiers in war. There are only a few people that I have occasionally met before. I go through the routine mechanically. In the evenings, I generally go to the soldier's home where the newspapers are laid out, but I do not read them. Still, there is a piano there that I am glad enough to play on. Two girls are in attendance. One of them is young. The camp is surrounded with high barbed wire fences. If we come back late from the soldier's home, we have to show passes. But those who are on good terms with the guard can get through, of course. Among the junipers, those are trees, and by the way, there are trees are bushes, and, and, and the juniper berry is what makes gin, the alcohol gin. Among the junipers and the birch trees on the moor, we practice company drill each day. It is bearable if one expects nothing better. We advance at a run, fling ourselves down, and our panting breath moves the stalks of the grasses and the flowers of the heather to and fro. Again, the man-made juxtaposition, the contrast of war with nature, with man-made things with nature. Looked at so closely, one sees the fine sand is composed of millions of the tiniest pebbles, as clear as if they had been made in a laboratory. It is strangely inviting to dig one's hands into it. Again, nature. But most beautiful are the woods with their line of birch trees. Their color changes with every minute. Now the stems gleam purest white, and between them, airy and silken, hangs the pastel green of the leaves. The next moment all changes to, to an opalescent blue as the shivering breezes pass down from the heights and touch the green lightly away. And again, in one place it deepens almost to black as, as a cloud passes over the sun. Here's an interesting symbol, cloud passing over the sun or a metaphor so that what could be bright and beautiful is now dark and dreary. Um, and this shadow moves like a ghost, simile, through the dim trunks and rides far out over the, over the moor to the sky. Then the birches stand out again like gay banners on white poles with their red and gold patches of autumn-tinted leaves. I often become so lost in the play of soft light and transparent shadow that I almost fail to hear the commands. It is when one is alone that one begins to observe nature and to love her. So this idea of being alone in the world and connecting your humanity with nature and what came before and what will always be is really important. And here I have not much companionship and do not even desire it. I don't even want friends at the camp. We are too little acquainted with one another to do more than joke a bit and play poker or nap in the evenings. Alongside our camp is the big Russian prison camp. It is separated from us by a wire fence, but in spite of this, the prisoners come across to us. They seem nervous and fearful, though most of them are big fellows with beards. They look like meek, scolded St. Bernard dogs. That's another interesting simile that, again, um, turns men into animals in some kind of way. Although St. Bernard dogs are very sweet and nice dogs. They slink about our camp and pick over the garbage tins. One can imagine what they find there. With us, food is pretty scarce and none too good at that. Turnips cut into six pieces and boiled in water and unwashed carrot tops. 
moldy potatoes are tidbits, and the chief luxury is a thin rice soup in which float little bits of beef sinew, that's the fat or the cartilage of beef. But these are cut up so small that they take a lot of finding. Everything gets eaten, notwithstanding, and if ever anyone is so well off as to not want all his share, there are a dozen others standing by ready to relieve him of it. That means everybody's really hungry. The food is awful, but at least it's food. Only the dregs, that means the leftover stuff at the bottom of a bowl. Only the dregs that the ladle cannot reach are tipped out and thrown into the garbage tins. Along with that, there sometimes go a few turnip peelings, moldy bread crusts and all kinds of muck. This thin, miserable, dirty garbage is the objective of the prisoners. They pick it out of the stinking tins greedily and go off with it under their blouses. It is strange to see these enemies of ours so close up. They have faces that make one think. Honest, peasant faces, broad foreheads, broad noses, broad mouths, broad hands, and thick hair. So they're, he's recognizing the humanity in the people that, he, that are imprisoned, the prisoners that they've taken. They ought to be put to threshing, reaping, and apple picking. They should be farmers. They should go back to the land. They look just as kindly as our own peasants in Friesland. And here is another example of how he's beginning to not understand why anyone is fighting in a war. They're people just like us. It is distressing to watch their movements, to see them begging for something to eat. They are all rather feeble, that means very weak, for they only get enough nourishment to keep them from starving. Ourselves, we have not had sufficient to eat for long enough. They have dysentery. That's a disease where the water is bad and makes you have diarrhea and stuff, and so you get dehydrated very quickly. Furtively, that means, you know, um, furtively means they're like hiding. Many of them display the blood-stained tails of their shirts. That means they've had so much diarrhea that they're bleeding from it. Their backs, their necks are bent, their knees sag, their heads droop as they stretch out their hands and beg in the few words of German they know. Beg with those soft, deep, musical voices that are like warm stoves and cozy rooms at home. So, Again, another simile that describes how even the prisoners are like their own family. Some men there are are some men there are who give them a kick so that they fall over, but those are not many. The majority do nothing to them, just ignore them. Occasionally, when they too, when they are too groveling, that means they're begging too much. It makes a man mad, and then he kicks them. If only they would not look at one so. What great misery can be in two such small spots, no bigger than a man's thumb, in their eyes. So he can see the suffering in their eyes. They can all see the suffering in their eyes, and it makes them sad and then angry that they, that they have to be there. They don't know how to handle their emotions. They come over to the camp in the evenings and trade. They exchange whatever they possess for bread. Often they have fair success because they have very good boots and ours are bad. The leather of their knee boots is wonderfully soft like suede. The peasants among us who get tidbits sent from home can afford to trade. The price of a pair of boots is about two or three loaves of army bread or a loaf of bread and a small tough ham sausage. But most of the Russians have long since parted with whatever things they had. Now they wear only the most pitiful clothing and try to exchange little carvings and objects that they have made out of shell fragments and copper driving bands. Of course, they don't get much for such things, though they may have taken immense pains with them. That means they took a long time to make them. They go for a slice or two of bread. Our peasants are hard and cunning when they bargain. They hold the piece of bread or sausage right under the nose of the Russian till he grows pale with greed and his eyes bulge, and then he will give anything for it. The peasants wrap up their booty with the utmost solemnity. They're very, very serious about it. And then get out their big pocket knives and slowly and deliberately cut off a slice of bread for themselves from their supply and with every mouthful take a piece of the good tough sausage and so reward themselves 
with a good feed. It is distressing to watch them take their afternoon meal thus. One would like to crack them over their thick pates. Pates means head. They rarely give anything away. How little we understand one another. The question about that is why. Why don't they understand each other? I am often on guard over the Russians. In the darkness, one sees their forms move like six, like six storks, like great birds. Again, another simile that these long, thin birds they move like. They come close up to the wire fence and lean their faces against it. Their fingers hook around the mesh. Often many stand side by side and breathe the wind that comes down from the moors and the forest, as if they too are remembering their home. They rarely speak and then only a few words. They are more human and more brotherly towards one another, it seems to me, than we are. So there's a difference. Why are they so brotherly to each other, more like friends? But perhaps that is merely because they feel themselves to be more unfortunate than us. Anyway, the war is over so far as they are concerned. But to wait for dysentery is not much of a life either. The territorials who are in charge of them say that they were much more lively at first. They used to have intrigues among themselves, as always happens. In other words, they used to have drama. Everything used to happen with each other among themselves, as always happens. And it would often come to blows and knives. They, they would fight each other with knives and, and fists. But now they're quite apathetic and listless. Apathetic, remember, means they don't care about anything anymore. Listless means lazy and not moving. Most of them do not masturbate anymore. They are so feeble, though otherwise things to come to such a pass that whole huts full of them do it. So again, it's another basic instinct for a man at that age. Don't forget, they're 20 years old, you know, at that age to do this. And some of them just don't have any need for it anymore. The basic human instincts of human beings are just gone. They stand at the wire fence. Sometimes one goes away and then another at one Another one, and then another at once takes his place in the line. Most of them are silent. Occasionally one begs a cigarette butt. I see their dark forms, their beards move in the wind. I know nothing of them except that they are prisoners, and that is exactly what troubles me. Their life is obscure and guiltless. I don't know anything. Obscure means I don't know anything about it. It's far away from me and, or hidden and guiltless. They, they have no guilt. If I could know more of them, what their names are, how they live, what they're waiting for, what their burdens are, then my emotion would have an object and might become sympathy. But as it is, I perceive behind them only the suffering of the creature, the awful melancholy of life and the pitilessness of men. So because he doesn't know them personally, he can't relate to them well enough. And that's how that goes. I, you know, when we don't know other people well enough, we don't know their stories, you know, in modern days, it's, it's how, it's how protests come about because people feel as if other people don't understand them. They don't understand their stories or their suffering or their pain. A word of command has made these silent figures our enemies. A word of command might transform them into our friends. At some table, a document is signed by some persons whom none of us knows. And then for years together, that very crime on which formerly the world's condemnation and severest penalty fall becomes our highest aim. That whole thing was a little bit complicated, but what it means is a bunch of men sat around a table, signed some papers, and at our expense, you know, at the fighter's expense, they have to go out and die and suffer. And the people at the top never, never get touched because they're in a room someplace making decisions. But who can draw such a distinction when he looks at these quiet men with their childlike faces and apostles' beards? That's a, a metaphor. The apostles are the people in the Bible who were prophets and who were friends, in this case, of Christ. Apostles can be anybody, but they were friends of Christ. And, um, and they were meant to be very, very good people. So here he is making this metaphor of making these Russians look like good men from the Bible. Any non-commissioned officer is more of an enemy to a recruit, any schoolmaster to a pupil, than they are to us. And yet we would shoot at them again, and they at us, if they were free. I am frightened. I dare think this way no more. 
This way lies the abyss. The abyss is a never-ending black hole. If I start thinking this way and start caring about them, then I'm going to fall into a black hole, be depressed, and die. So we can't afford to think that way. It is not now the time, but I will not lose these thoughts. I will keep them, shut them away until the war is ended. My heart beats fast. This is the aim, the great, the sole aim that I have thought of in the trenches, that I have looked for as the only possibility of existence after the annihilation, that means the complete destruction, of all human feeling. This is a task that I will make life afterward worthy of these hideous years. And so he'll put away the thoughts of making human beings and friends of other things. He can't think about it now. He's got to survive. I take out my cigarettes, break each one in half, and give them to the Russians. They bow to me and then light the cigarettes. Now red points glow in every face. They comfort me, the lights. It looks as though they were little windows in dark village cottages, saying that behind them are rooms full of peace. So his offering, this metaphor and simile of the offering of the cigarettes and seeing the red lights reminds him of windows of people's homes where there is peace. So this offering becomes the peace offering. This can be connected to larger ideas. What is it that we can do as human beings to help each other's suffering? The days go by. On a foggy morning, another of the Russians is buried. Almost every day, one of them dies. I am on guard during the bur burial. The prisoners say a, a sing a chorale. They sing in parts, and it sounds almost as if there were no voices, but an organ far away on the moor. A moor is, is a long... Um, field, um, usually with usually with a little bit of water and things like that. Very beautiful. The burial is quickly over. In the evening they stand again at the wire fence and the wind comes down to them from the beech woods. The stars are cold. Even the stars are cold. They're not welcoming. There's no, he feels no hope. That's a metaphor, by the way. I, I now know a few of those who speak a little German. There is a musician amongst them. He says he used to be a violinist in Berlin. When he hears that I can play the piano, he fetches his violin and plays. The others sit down and lean their backs against the fence. He stands up and plays. Sometimes he has that absent expression which violinists get when they close their eyes, or again he sways the instrument to the rhythm and smiles across to me. He plays mostly folk songs and the others hum with him. They are like a country of dark hills that sing far down under the ground, another simile. The sound of the violin stands like a slender girl above it and is clear and alone, again a simile. The voices cease and the violin continues alone. In the night, it is so thin it sounds frozen. One, one must stand close up. It would be much better in a room out here. It makes a man grow sad. Because I've already had a long leave, I get none on Sundays. So the last Sunday before I go back to the front, my father and eldest sister come over to see me. All day we sit in the soldier's home. Where else could we go? We don't want to stay in the camp. About midday we go for a stroll on the moors. The hours are torture. We don't know what to talk about, so we speak of my mother's illness. It is now definitely cancer. She is already in the hospital and will be operated on shortly. The doctors hope she will recover, but we have never heard of cancer being cured. Where is she then, I ask? In the Louisa Hospital, says my father. In which class? Third. We must wait till we know what the operation costs. She wanted to be in the third herself. She said that then she would have some company, and besides, it's cheaper. So... She's lying there with all those people. If only she could sleep properly. My father nods. His face is broken and full of furrows. My mother has always been sickly, and though she has only gone to the hospital when she has been compelled to, it has cost a great deal of money, and my father's life has been practically given up to it. So his mother's been sick forever. It costs a lot of money to go to a hospital. She's now in a ward, not in a private room, but with a bunch of other people. 
If only I knew how much the operation costs, he says he. Have you not asked? Not directly. I cannot do that. The surgeon might take it as, take it amiss, and that would not do. He must operate on mother. So if the surgeon gets offended, he might not do the operation or not do it well on his mother. Yes, I think bitterly. That's how it is with us and with all poor people. They don't dare ask the price, but worry themselves dreadfully beforehand about it. But the others for whom it is not important, they settle the price first as a matter of course, and the doctor does not take it amiss from them. You see, the difference between economic issues and, and people with different economic stature has been around forever. Um, poor people always, I know I did when my son was sick, I always worried about saying something to a doctor if I couldn't afford a good doctor. And, um, and, if, you, and if you say something, you're afraid they won't treat them and take care of them. And so this becomes a huge worry for people who, you know, have people that are important to them that are in hospitals. The dressings afterwards are so expensive, says my father. That's that's the band-aids and the and the and the white stuff that you know you fold around the body. That's that's expensive too. Doesn't the invalids fund pay anything toward it then? I ask. Mother has been ill too long. It's kind of like, you know, Medicaid or Medicare. Is there a point at which they don't pay anymore or they don't pay well enough? Have you any money at all? He shakes his head no, but I can do some overtime. I know. He will stand at his desk folding and pasting and cutting until 12 o'clock at night. At 8 o'clock in the evening, he will eat some miserable rubbish they get in exchange for their food tickets, and he will take a powder for his headache and work on. In order to cheer him up a bit, I tell him a few stories, soldiers' jokes and the like, about generals and sergeant majors. Afterwards, I accompany them both to the railway station. They give me a pot of jam and a bag of potato cakes that my mother has made for me. Then they go off and I return to the camp. In the evening, I spread the jam on the cakes and eat some, but I have no taste for them. So I go out to give them to the Russians. Then it occurs to me that my mother cooked them herself and that she was probably in pain as she stood before the hot stove. I put the bag back in my pack and take only two cakes to the Russians. So he has some sense of guilt here. This is a, uh, a man versus self-conflict. There are other conflicts that we've just seen. This is a man versus self-conflict. And you can see through his actions and his thoughts that he's becoming more and more of a grown man. Before he went to the war, he never would have thought twice about his mother's efforts. Now that he's in the war, he thinks about how the Russians feel. He thinks about how other soldiers feel. He thinks about how his mother feels. And because her, because she was in such pain when she made these potato cakes, he savors them, even though he wants to share them with other people. He, he has the decision about whether or not to selfishly keep some from starving people because he knows his mother is dying. Anyway, when next we meet, we'll be meeting for Chapter 9 of All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, that'll probably be broken up into sections. We'll see. And... Um, Again, you're looking for big pictures. Uh, think about the central ideas that are involved here and the poetic devices. You saw a ton of them here, some contrast and some imagery that, that brought and some um, very vivid nature. And um, you saw mood, you saw tone, uh, and you saw all those things. So when next we meet, we continue on Paul's journey through war, leaving his home, and going back to the front, where it is all quiet in chapter 9.